So thank you everyone for joining us today for World Braille Day. That is January 4th, and we're celebrating the birth of Louis Braille, the inventor of Braille. We're going to talk about some of the myths about the origin of Braille. And our guest today is Philippa Campsey, an independent researcher from Toronto, Canada. So thank you so much, Philippa, for being here. So today we're going to focus on the protagonist of the story, who is Charles Babier. Uh, was he really the villain? Over the last year, I've read about 10 books about Louis, and they've contradicted themselves. And then since reading Philippa's paper about her research, it has shed some light on why that is. So today we're going to talk about Philippa's findings. Uh, so Philippa, do you mind starting off with setting the scene? Um, it's the early 1800s in France. What was going on then? Well, a, a great deal. A great deal. So um, the uh, the early 1800s is the time of Napoleon. Um, but Napoleon is kicked off the stage with the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, and um, the monarchy is reestablished. So the institute that we're most interested in, um, which was founded uh, before the revolution, uh, was known as the Institution Royale des Jeunes Aveugles, the royal institution, because it had been um, blessed by royalty before the revolution. During the revolution and during the period of Napoleon, um, the students there were simply um, forced to share accommodations with older people in a hospital mm -hmm. uh, for blind, um, originally intended for blind war veterans, um, but had become a, a hospital for blind people in general. The students were in there, they weren't getting much training. Mm -hmm. So just after, after Waterloo, after the restoration of the monarchy, the school is reestablished um, in 1815 and Louis Braille arrives four years later. So it's still pretty new. It's still, they're still kind of finding their feet. And, uh, so they, 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 a lot of things had changed. The revolution had changed so many things and people wanted to change everything in the revolution from, you know, the hours of the day to the months of the year to mm -hmm. the way everything was done. This uh, sort of the, the breaks had been put on a lot of that with the restoration of the monarchy, but there was also a feeling that new things could happen, um, that people could do things in different ways. So there had been there had been the, the revolution, which threw away a lot of what was old, the period of Napoleon, who imposed a lot of new things, including a new system of laws. And now this restoration of the monarchy, which was going backwards a little bit, but not entirely, because people had got a taste for um, doing things in a new way. Sounds like an exciting time with everything changing and questioning the norms and figuring out what mm -hmm. they want to do going forward. So we have Louis Braille. He was blinded as a child at three, and then he moves to Paris at 10 years old to attend the Royal Institute for Blind Youth. Um, my French is non-existent, so I will just anglicize that. That's fine. <laughs> oh, so at the Royal Institute for Blind Youth, and the picture books depict uh, a four-story building with a triangular roof. Uh, what have you found in your research? Is that an accurate image for where Louis went no, to that's school? No, that's, that's not the building that, uh, uh, that Louis Braille would have known for most of his life. That building was built in the 1840s and opened then. So in 1819, um, Louis Braille was going to a rather damp and decrepit building that had originally been built as a convent and then used as a prison. Mm -hmm. um, a, a un particularly unpleasant massacre had taken place there during the revolution. It was old, it was damp, it was um, pretty grungy. Uh, pictures of it show it about six stories high. Um, apparently it was a bit of a rabbit warren inside um and had been sort of rejigged and and so forth so he the, the nice neoclassical building that is now visible um on the boulevard des invalides in paris is not the one he would have known um he was he was in a the building the building he knew has gone it's been demolished mm, okay thank you so when louis first arrived to this school uh, he was really excited about learning how to read and write 
and they had some books there. Uh, do you mind sharing with us what was the reading method at that time? The reading method was the one that had been developed before the revolution by the founder of the school, Valentin Aoui. Um, it was raised type. But what has always amazed me is that instead of taking the most simplified form of letters and using that as raised type, they used cursive script. Very, very <laughs> difficult. I mean, I, you know, is there a way to make this harder for students? Um, that they had to learn how to trace this cursive script. And of course, in cursive script, letters like A and C and O are all very similar in shape. Um, and so it must have been enormously difficult. And the other thing was that, of course, they couldn't write using it. They couldn't create that themselves. They could read it, but they couldn't um, use the technology to create additional writing. They learned... Some of them learned how to use, write using a pencil in a way that sighted people could read, mm -hmm. but they couldn't write in a way that they could read back to themselves. Have any of these books survived that Valentino oh. created? Oh, yes, yes. You can see um, the, the, the book that Louis published himself is written in this in this fashion. Valentin Aoui, the name is now given to the Association Valentin Aoui, which is now a a training center. The Institut National still exists and it's still the school for school-aged children, but there's a training center for adults located just across the street from it. Um, and uh, they have a museum in there and there are many books in the museum that show what the old system looked like and some of the printing plates they used even. Wow. So how many pages would it take to write a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you could, you could get Oh, you could get at least two or three sentences onto a page um, okay. if they weren't too long. Um, but uh, no, it took a, a huge amount of space. Unlike modern Braille, they couldn't have it on both sides of a page. That would be impossible. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was one side only. So according to the traditional story of Braille, a military captain visited the school one day by the name of Charles Barbier. And he's depicted a lot of times in picture books as wearing, it has like a white poofy collar, uh, very formal looking uniform. Um, so what have you found? Um, can you tell us more about Charles? Yeah, well, Charles never visited the school for one thing. Um, so the, and, uh, and he, by the time he was 25 years old, he was no longer in the military. Um, so he did have a military background. Um, he, he trained in a military school. But when the revolution broke out, he left the country. Um, the ranks of the, the military uh, officers were all taken from the ranks of the aristocracy. It was not a good time to be a member of the aristocracy. So at least half of all officers in the king's French army uh, left the country. Some went to other countries in Europe and some went to the United States. Barbier went to the United States because he had a brother who was already settled there. And uh, he was there for, I don't know quite how long he was there because I'm not sure what date he came back, but he was there for at least 10 years, probably more. He eventually came back to France sometime after about 1802, probably, and uh, settled in Paris. He did not rejoin the military. So mm -hmm. people who, who he's, I've seen him described as a member of Napoleon's army. No, not at all. Um, mm -hmm. And I've also seen uh, uh, things about how he went to the same training school as uh, Napoleon and they knew each other. No, also mm -hmm. no. Um, so he comes back, he has made some money in the United States. And so he can actually afford not to live too high off the hog, but he can afford to live as a gentleman without having to work for a living. And he has he can also afford to explore his interests. His interests were in alternative forms of writing, starting with shorthand. He developed a form of shorthand. I've looked at it in its in incredibly complicated and I can't imagine mm -hmm. that anybody would want to use it. And there were already plenty of other forms of shorthand out there. But then he created another set of alternative forms of writing. Mm -hmm. One of which, he's very clear about this, this is intended for people who are blind. This is not intended mm -hmm. for anybody else. This is intended for people who are blind. 
it's raised, it's made up of dots. And that's what, what the school uses, but he doesn't bring it to the school. He writes to the school, um, but he doesn't go to the school. And uh, the director of the school takes the, the tools and the instructions, hands them over to a senior student, probably um, a fellow called Augustin Moulin, and says, we'll see what you make of this. And if it works for you, teach it to the other students. So that's how the idea was transmitted. Wow, that is so different from what is in the books now. <laughs> yes. Typically it's yeah. depicted as Charles visits the school, he demonstrates it and Louis is there. He's all excited. He goes and practices, sees shortcomings of the system which in the books they call it night writing or sonography, but what did Charles actually call his system? Um, he had his, he made up his own little word for it. He called it expeditive, which is an, is a, a really dumb name for it. Expeditive was the name he originally coined for his form of shorthand. And then when he created these other forms of writing, he continued to use the term expeditive. He published it, the, the, the school was only one of the places um, he tried to publicize his ideas. He, he uh, submitted it to uh, members of the Académie des Sciences, and they wrote a report on it, and a very favorable report about how this could be useful, and so forth. But, um, so he had a number of different places it was published, and one of the places um, the book that he published in 1815 contained 12 different forms of writing, of which the, the one with raised dots was only one. And the uh, another publication uh, presented these with a with a big double page spread showing how they all looked and worked. And they they gave them interesting names. And the I think it was the editor of that publication who came up with the idea of écriture nocturne night writing. Mm -hmm. um, and Barbie quite liked it. It was a good name. It was helpful. Um, it helped people understand that you didn't have to, to see to, to write down what you were doing. Um, he, he often confused the issue by then calling it expeditive nocturne, which makes no sense whatsoever. But um, Barbie was very bad at promoting and publicizing his own ideas. And he often tended to shoot himself in the foot. So um, this is kind of typical, and it's part of, part, perhaps part of why the story has been so confused and jumbled over the years is because he never really made it clear. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, the other reason is that that book that he published in 1815, until the days of Google Books, it was almost impossible to find. So most of these accounts, the original accounts, were written without people being able to see what it was he had done in the first place. Nobody nobody knew what it looked like. So they felt free to describe it in any way they thought. That makes sense. Yeah, and it's so handy that you speak French uh, and English so you can read the original documents because um, that makes a difference going to the primary sources. And in Charles' book, did he specify about who he created his systems for? Oh, he was very clear. This one was um, the, the the twelve systems are are for different audiences. Um, there are some coded ones that he thinks might be used by diplomats or even spies. Um, for example, there's one that looks like musical notation that you could hide a message in. But this one, this particular one, and not only does he uh, show how it's supposed to look but he includes a picture of the tool that you would need, the, little, the mm -hmm. sort of blunt punch, um, mm -hmm. a version of which is still in use, of course, um, to make the dots. So the way that his system worked, different people have described it in different ways, but basically it's it all his 12 plus systems, because he has 12 basic systems and then variations on some of them were based on a grid. Imagine a grid of five boxes across and five boxes down into which you fit 25 letters of the alphabet. And I do mean 25 because W was rarely used at the time. And then you could, by that, using that grid, you could then translate those letters 
into a number combination. So A, which is in the first row in the first column is one, one. Mm. B is in the first row, second column, it's one, two. Z in the final one, fifth column, fifth row, fifth column, five, five. So you create it, in a, it into a two digit number. You assign a symbol for each of those five numbers. And then you can use the combinations of those two symbols to represent the letters of the alphabet. And he had all kinds, I mean, some of them were just simple kind of sticks and shapes and things like that. And some of them were much more complicated. And this one is simply um, the, the two digits are represented by two vertical rows of dots. Um, so you just count, you count the dots and that gives you the two digit number, which gives you the letter. I love how simple that is. It just makes it easy to memorize, easy to use. It, it was very simple. Um, I think its simplicity helped uh, in its adoption at the school because it didn't take a long time to learn. Now, that said, he created two versions. One was alphabetical and another one was phonetic. Mm. Um, and most people focused on the phonetic one and Barbier himself was very keen on the phonetic one, but he was thinking of people who had no education at all and had not learned how to spell. That did not apply to the students at the school. They'd all learned how to spell. They knew their alphabets and they knew how to spell. So they didn't have to use the phonetic one. And because he wasn't there looking over their shoulders and telling them what to do, um, I assume that the Augustin Moulin and Pinier and the other people who were involved said, oh, if, you know, never mind about the phonetic one. We can easily adapt this alphabetical one. It takes no time to learn. Other people who tried to learn it said, you know, you can, you can master it in an afternoon, really. It doesn't take long. You can demonstrate it very quickly. And that's what made it so, so, uh, that's what it made, sort of got it into the uh, school is because it was so easy. Uh, it took so little time to learn. And, uh, and it, because it's, it's so, so easy, um, some of the, the, the problems with Braille, which is, a little more complicated, uh, weren't there because anybody could learn it. The teachers didn't find it threatening because it was something even they could master very, very quickly. I love it how supportive Charles was at the school, sending slates there, writing letters to the director, explaining his system. He just really wanted to make learning accessible to everyone. Yeah, yeah. No, he's, his, his ultimate goal, I mean, helping this group of people was just part of his big plan and his big plan was universal education at a time when you know only a, a, a less than half of the population was literate um universal education was not an element at the time and uh, he felt that everybody should have access to education to learning to some they should be able to write in some form to be able to capture their ideas um, and he felt they should be open to everybody. And so he launched all these different ideas, um, all these different ways of reading and writing, um, say, saying, you know, pick one, <laughs> use it. <laughs> um, because he, he was so keen on universal education. And that meant, you know, all the people who had been excluded, and that include people who are blind, people who are deaf, people who had other kinds of handicaps, um, or people who are simply too poor um, to take time away from work to, to get an education. They, this was intended to be accessible for all of those groups. So where did we get this story of Charles visiting the school? Why do you think that came into what we think is the traditional story for Braille? Um, well, I think most people assume that that's what would have happened. Mm -hmm. um, the first biographer, the first, well, Pinier was, wrote a biography of, of Braille and uh, Pinier, the director of the school, wrote a biography of Braille in 1859, um, which implies that Barbier came to the school. Mm -hmm. um, another historian writing about almost a uh, hundred years later in 1952, a guy called Pierre Henri, he wasn't quite sure how this happened, so he concocted a theory. And he, he says, this is probably how things happened, but he didn't know. All they knew was that 
The school at a certain point started using Barbier's script. And that was the spark that lit Louis Braille's imagination and helped him go on to create the much more usable system we have now. Um, but I don't think anybody was quite sure. So people invented things and most people assumed, well, you know, the Barbie probably came to the school and showed it to them. Um, and nobody, as far as I know, other than me and a couple of other people have ever read letters that he wrote to the school, which make it very clear he didn't go there. Um, Pigny was kind of holding him off and, and uh, keeping him at one remove. Um, and uh, I mean, PDA lost the first letter entirely, and then Barbier wrote again. I'm sorry, oh, you you interested? And uh, but PDA didn't didn't want him to come, and uh, deferred and deferred and deferred. And by the time Barbier actually came for a sort of pro forma meeting with PDA, the method was already in use. They were already using it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not. That's not intuitively obvious. So I think most people just assumed, oh, we must have come to the school and demonstrated it. That's the most likely way. Where are these letters now? Um, there are two sets of letters. So the letters that Barbier wrote to the school are still at the school. There's a, there's a library and it has an archives and those letters are still there. There's one very large box full of Barbier's letters, mostly to Pignier, but also to some other members of the school. Um, such as the head of the Board of Governors. Uh, in the Association d'Alentrain Aoui that I mentioned that has the museum, they have a large box of both documents and objects donated mm -hmm. by Barbier's family. Barbier himself had no children, he never married, um, but uh, the grandson of a nephew um, in about 2001, donated this box to the school, saying it's, you know, clean in our family, and it probably should be somewhere where it can be studied by scholars. However, scholars have, until recently, taken very little interest in this. Um, and the, the box is full of all kinds of things. I mean, Barbier, Barbier kept coming, trying to come up with new ways of communicating, um, and it's full of all sorts of quite interesting and odd and completely impractical methods of communication. Um, but it, he, he, he kept trying to come up with alternative methods of communication. That was his, that was the, the, what he devoted his life to. So do we have an idea of when Charles and Louis finally met? Did they ever meet? Yes, they did. Yes. And they became quite friendly. Um, <laughs> so any rumors you may have heard that they, they weren't on friendly terms are just that rumors. <laughs> Um, they did not meet until the, the 1830s, um, about 1833. So there's a letter in the archives in which Charles Barbier writes to Pigny and says, I've heard that there's this alternative version of writing with raised points, and I'd be interested to take a look. So somebody sends him the book, the, the first volume, the first version of Louis Braille's system, which would, had been published in 1829. So this is four years later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the communication has largely broken down between Pignier and, and Barbier at this point. Uh, but Barbier is still curious and he's heard about this and he wants to see it. He reads it and the very next day he writes to Braille saying, congratulations, good on you. Um, wow. Now being Barbier, he says, of course, if I'd been doing it, I would have done, done it differently. But, you know, he's, he's still very positive. Mm -hmm. And there are letters um, that refer to visits. So Louis Braille, um, with a friend, used to come and visit Barbier. Barbier had a house on the, um, on the island, the Ile de la Cité, you know, near uh, Notre Dame. And uh, uh, so Braille would come and visit him there. And there's also a, a letter saying, you know, oh, I'm sorry that when I stopped by, you weren't there. But they corresponded and they were friendly and they got together. Not a, not a huge number of times, but maybe is, you know, half a dozen times, a dozen times. Um, and uh, there, there is correspondence between the two. 
that really just changes everything. Like Charles is not the villain of the story. He's supportive. Yeah. He's encouraging. <laughs> yes. Oh, he's very encouraging. And in, uh, I mean, Louis Braille acknowledges this um, when he when he republishes his, you know, when he or, well, actually, when he publishes his first book in 1829, he thanks Louis, Charles Barbier for giving him the inspiration. And everybody says, oh, well, you know, he's just being very generous and kind. Well, no, he's actually being honest <laughs> that it was Barbier's inspiration. It was Barbier's tools that made it possible for him to do what he did. And uh, so Braille is, is simply, you know, being, being very respectful um, and acknowledging his sources. Mm. It's interesting how what the storybook's called night writing, sonography, um, which is more actually called the raised point writing that Charles came up with, that there was no spelling, no punctuation, no way to write numbers. Um, but you found something that shows that there was a way to write numbers. Yeah, well, I didn't find it, actually. Okay. Um, this happened during the pandemic. And during the pandemic, a volunteer uh, called Mireille Duhen uh, was at, she was sort of just basically cleaning out the cupboards in the museum. So the museum was closed, there were no visitors and things. And so she was cleaning out the cupboards and also trying to make a, create a, an inventory of all the materials in, in that museum. And there's, there's a lot of them, there's stuff in the museum, which is a, one very large room with a lot of cupboards in it. And there are also more things in the basement. And uh, she came across this and she was very excited because she'd been very helpful when I was when I was working on the original research. And she said, we have we have them. We have numbers. We have numbers. Um, so she she sent me um, the illustration that you've seen um, that. Yes. And I don't know who it's it, there's no date on the document. It's not clear whose writing it is, but somebody somewhere and it's. The writing is not unlike Barbier's song. Somebody somewhere thought, well, we need this for numbers and created them. Um, they obviously weren't widely used and clearly not widely known, but they did exist and it was possible um, to use the system for numbers. True, the other things were not, um, uh, punctuation and capitalization was not part of Barbier's scheme. But um, I like to think of Barbier, what Barbier did as a kind of proof of concept. Mm -hmm. It was because it was simple. It didn't have any um, add-ons. It didn't have any sort of special features. It was just really basic, like, here's how you can write the alphabet um, if you haven't been able to do before. And, and of course, this is the this is the reason Louis got excited and let us be careful about this because it wasn't just Louis. Everybody was excited. I mean, Louis, Louis gets all the, the, the praise, but the students, this is huge. They can write. They couldn't write before. There was no way that they could pass a note to somebody else in class, let alone, you know, take notes um, mm -hmm. or capture their thoughts, write anything down that they, they, they just had to memorize everything. So the, the, this gave them an ability to write down something that they could read back to themselves, that they could hand to a fellow student that would capture their, their ideas. So yes, the, the, the accounts sort of focus on Louis as being, you know, sort of inspired by this. No, they were all, you know, just so excited and so happy to have a way to capture their ideas in a very simple form, um, requiring simple materials and simple tools. And it was a collaborative effort too, especially between Louis's uh, first version of Braille with had, had dots and dashes, and then uh, he was getting feedback from peers, and then he simplified it to just dots. Louis, Louis, as far as I can tell, he was quite a popular student. He had lots of friends. Um, some of the books mention uh, Gabriel Gautier, who was one of his friends, uh, who was about a contemporary. I think he was maybe a year older than, than uh, Louis. Augustin Moulin was, a, was quite a bit older. He's more like five years older. And in a school, that is a, that's a big gap. But Louis had lots of friends. There was the friend who, who used to take him to visit uh, 
uh, Charles Babier. So he was surrounded by other people. Um, Pinier, the director of the school, had his back and was very keen and helped him carve out time to work on this, both when he was a student and later when he was a teacher at the school, because he stayed at the school as an adult and continued to teach. And a lot of the work he did, though people go on and on and on about him being a young inventor, he was well into his 20s by the time he actually finished and perfected the, the system that we now think of as Braille. His early, his early tries are not what we use right now. Um, but, uh, but yes, it would have been very collaborative. Uh, we don't know, I mean, there's, there's no documentation of who he worked with. We do know from other things that he worked with other people, um, you know, in creating Decapoint. And he, he worked with a guy called Foucault. Um, so he was clearly used to collaborating, working with other people, getting their opinions on things, getting, getting feedback uh, from the director and presumably other teachers of the school. So this idea of him being this solitary genius working in complete isolation, He's ridiculous. He's surrounded by other people. And I'm sure he was always, you know, thrusting bits of paper at people and saying, what do you think? Does this work for you? Can you read what I've just written? <laughs> that really changes the story. He wasn't a child inventor. Uh, he started working it as a kid, yeah. but it took him years to perfect it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, he did start early, um, but he didn't finish early. It took him 16 years over time eight years to produce the first book and another eight years to produce the second one, which refines and improves on the original. Um, yes, he was, uh, it, that was a long time to, to, to work on these things. And in the meantime, I mean, he had to earn his living. Um, you know, he was teaching, he was playing the organ, he was doing all kinds of other things. So he didn't have unlimited time. So it did, it, it, it stretched out partly because of that. Um, but uh, yes, it just, it, it probably a lot of trial and error until he finally came up with, with what worked and what, and what other people agreed worked. So do we know what happened to Charles? What did he do after he published his book in 1815? He, oh yes, well, he, um, he continued to experiment. And again, he, because of his interest in uh, universal education, he was trying to drum up interest in his other methods of writing. He approached the School for the Deaf, um, mm -hmm. which is not that far away in, in Paris. It's, it's um, you know, maybe a, a mile or so away from the, the, uh, the school that Louis Braille attended. Um, and uh, they, they were quite interested and they said, well, you know, the, he actually did go to the school, I think, and met with their director. Um, and he created some little giveaways and they said, well, why don't we give these to the students and their parents? But his systems weren't as applicable to deaf children as they, as they were to uh, students who were blind. Um, he tried to get his ideas adopted in nursery schools for the children of the poor. Um, mm -hmm. This was a new initiative in about the 1830s of creating little schools um, and these were for the children of people, of working class parents when their parents were away all day. So rather having, than having these children running free in the streets, they were going to create these little schools, which they called asyl, which means sort of like an asylum, but it was sort of a, a, a safe place for them, a safe place for these children where they could learn a few skills. They weren't expected to go on and get a full education but it kept them off the streets and they were gonna learn a few, they were gonna get some kind of training while they were there. And I think he even tried a few demonstration projects. At the time of his death in, in 1841, he was still trying to get some demonstration projects going to indicate that perhaps these children in these unusual little schools might be good candidates for some of these other alternative forms of writing that he had developed. So he kept plugging away Mm -hmm. um, he kept sending his stuff to the Académie des Sciences, and after a while, they started thinking, "Okay, uh, you know, <laughs> enough already." Um, but uh, he he kept pushing his ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept, unfortunately, refining them and changing them 
um, which meant that sort of something he'd done five years ago was very different from something he was doing today. And if somebody actually had adopted it back then, then it wouldn't match with, with what he was coming up with. But he never, ever stopped trying it. The, the last letter written about a month before he died, um, he's trying to, it's unclear, it seems to be written to a printer and he seems to be trying to insert some sort of advertisement into a journal. Hmm. Uh, that's all we can really tell because it's a draft of a letter. I don't think the letter was ever sent and it's not clear who it's going to. But he kept trying to promote his ideas and his ideas were for everyone. I love that. Oh. So you had published a paper in 2021 um, about your findings and the primary sources that you were um, reading to find out, uh, get a better idea of what happened um, from the origin of Braille and Charles's influence. So what are your goals for this year, for 2023? Well, if I can get back to France, um, there's still a lot of material there I've never had a chance to, to look at. Um, all of this research has been done while I'm on holiday in France. Um, so I have never had a good, big, you know, sort of, I, I, I'm just doing this on my own because I find it interesting. Um, but uh, so I've never had a, a long period of time to look at the materials. Originally, when I was looking at the materials that are in the library and archives of the school, I had very restricted access. I could not photocopy or photograph anything. All I could do is transcribe. Mm -hmm. um, and that slowed me down. So there, I took notes on everything I could and I made an inventory of all the letters that were there. Um, but I would like to finish off the business of transcribing all of the letters um, in case there's stuff in there that, that I didn't capture the first time around. And I would also like to spend a little time looking at some of the subsidiary characters because really in the story, the, the three characters um, who are most important are Barbier, Braille, and Pigné, the director of the school. But there are a lot of other additional characters. There's this student, Augustin Moulin, um, who went on like Braille to become a teacher at the school. And I don't know that there's a little bit, but Pigny wrote about him um, a bit, but uh, I'd like to see if there's more about him because I think he actually had a, a, a critical role in helping um, get this idea adopted. Um, Louis Braille's friend, Gabriel Gauthier, also stayed on at the school and became a teacher. Pigny also wrote a little bit about him. I'd like to know more about him. The Board of Governors in the school, there's um, a guy called Alexis de Noailles, who, um, who was working a lot behind the scenes uh, when, when Pigny was kind of getting very testy because Barbier could be, Barbier could be annoying. He was persistent mm -hmm. um, and he would keep going on and on and on about, you know, do this, do that. And then Pigny's thinking like, let me do my own job. Um, and uh, the board, of, the head of the board of governors of the school, uh, no, I was trying to keep things going, trying to keep everybody happy, trying to keep you know people from tearing each other apart. And I'd like to know more about you know what what he did. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more about uh, what happened at the school for the deaf. Um, mm -hmm. There was a little bit there, but yes, I, I would like to. I would like to know. I would like to find out what more is available um, in the archives about Louis's contemporaries. Whether there's anything in the archives that would shed light on how they helped and supported Braille, because they, we we all you know what we know is the tip of the iceberg. We now we now know that the old story is which was created in a vacuum because the facts were not known um, or some facts had been kind of blown out of proportion. We know that's not true, but what we know now is only kind of a little bit of the story. We know some the, the main lines of the story, but we still don't know. There are some supporting characters in there we don't know much about, and I would like to know more about. So whenever I get back there, whatever that is, that's the priority. 
Um, I should be able to have better access, I think. Having published the, the, the paper, I think my access to the, some of the sources will be better and I may have be, be able to get sort of use my time more productively, not just by transcribing, but being able to photograph and photocopy things mm -hmm. and then bring them home and work on them here. The Louis Childhood Home is also a museum. Have you had a chance to go through their museum and look at their archives? Yes, um, they were the one piece that they provided that was really useful quite early on. Um, one of the directors of that museum had written to the Ministry of Defense to ask for uh, Charles Barbier's military record. Um, oh. And nobody had known what it is. This is why there were all these things about how, you know, how well or whether or not he knew uh, Napoleon. And uh, now we know, you know, what school he attended, because there were several, um, and where he was posted, and what he did, and when he left, and the fact that when he left, he didn't come back. Um, so all that has been mm -hmm. nailed down, and that was all in Coupre. Um, So they have, they, that, that kind of, that museum is a little bit more of, it's, a, it's an interactive museum, and they encourage you to sort of try things out, and learn to write Braille, and, and so forth. They do have an archives, it's not quite as available, um, but uh, if you write, or if you get in touch with them ahead of time, and say, do you have anything on this, they might well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that would also be worth investigating to see, you know, what, what else do they have that, that I mean, I, I didn't expect to find what I did find there. So who knows what else they might have? Could be anything might be, I mean, they might have more letters to Braille from friends and things like that, that might shed mm -hmm. light on. So one last question, is there anything else you'd like to share about your research on Charles Barbier? It's going to be a long, slow business of trying to, you know, it's like getting, you know, the Queen Mary to turn around mid-ocean to, to change this narrative that is now so well established. Um, it's in books, particularly children's books. It's in all kinds of YouTube videos focusing on, on Louis' achievements. Um, and just the, the more you look at them, you think sort of where do you even begin to set the record straight? Um, the first, I mean, the first thing I did once I published the article was go back to Wikipedia. I thought if nowhere else, it's gonna be in Wikipedia and it's gonna be right. <laughs> like, and I can make sure it stays that way. Um, I wrote to the Encyclopedia Britannica. I wrote to any, you know, I, any place that I've seen um, errors that seems that, that could be fixed, which is mainly web-based uh, materials. I thought, well, let's start there and get the story correct on the web because that's easier to change. All these printed books, they, you know, they're out there, they're in libraries everywhere, they're not gonna change. Um, so the best you can do, maybe I need to make a video and put it on YouTube um, just to, to say, actually, it didn't happen that way. This is what happened, but that's, that's it for the future. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on our video. This will go on YouTube. Um, so thank you for helping us learn more about the origin of Braille and celebrating World Braille Day with us. So thank you, Philippa. Okay, well, happy birthday, Louie. <laughs>